Good evening and welcome to the meeting of the Folkestone and Hyde District and Parish Council Committee. Uh, please note this meeting is being streamed live to the internet. Please could all attendees ensure the microphone is set to mute unless they are speaking to reduce any background noise. And it is important to remember that you may only speak when called by the chairman. Ensure all other devices nearby are switched off to silent mode as they can be distracting. Members should use the raise hand button when they wish to speak. And when it is your turn to speak, the chairman will invite you to speak. Um, we're now on to the first item of the agenda, which is the appointment of the chairman. So I'll hand over to the committee for that. I, I nominate um, Councillor Hobbs. Yep. I'd second that, that nomination. Agreed. Agreed. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank you, Kate. We'll make, make a start, first of all, with apologies. We haven't got any as such. However, um, Graham Allison has hurt his knee, normally goes up to the village hall to um, log in on the parish council computer. He's going to try and do it with his phone, but it doesn't look like it's happened. And the other one with was Lazo Dudas, who was hoping to be with us. He may still be. However, his wife went into hospital just before Christmas, um, and she came out the day of our last area committee meeting. However, she caught COVID, and so did he. Um, they've both been suffering from it, and they, but they are both at home and recovering, so they're on the mend. Mm. He was hoping to at least make an appearance. Here, he's just coming. He's just coming. Wait for him to get in. Oh, and Emily. Better hang on for both of them, haven't we? Before we go any further. I'm sorry, um, Frank, I can't get my video working at the moment. Okay. We can hear you, so... Yeah, I can hear you. It's fine. Emily, we can see the top of your head. Ah, oh, there you are. Okay. We'll carry on. Was that somebody else coming in? No. Declarations of interest. Members of the, count of the meeting should declare any interests which fall under the categories of disclosure, disclosable pecuniary interests, other significant interests, or voluntary announcements of other interests. Are there any? No. Right. Move on to the minutes of the meeting held on the 24th of September. Are you happy with them? Yes. Great. I'm, I'm I'm happy with them as an accurate record, Frank. Thank you. I'm happy, Frank. Great. How do we go about that now, Kate? She's disappeared. No, she's uh, you know, <laughs> that's right. I can send those to you for signature, Councillor Hobbs. Okay. Right. Moving on to the other items then. We've got five tonight, all of which would have been brought forward by the district. The first one is the March census for 2021, and it should be Lee Poppy. That's me. Um, can you all hear me okay? Can you hear me, yes. Councillor Hobbs? Yes. yes, thank you, yeah. Okay. Um, Kate, am I able to share the screen? Looks yes. like I can. Right, I'm just gonna pull up a very short, um, presentation which is really top line stuff around the census um, the timings the dates uh, and how you know hopefully everyone can can support in getting as many people to complete the census as possible I'll go through this brief presentation and then I'm obviously more than happy to take um, questions at the end so um, I'll go for the presentation first so census 2021 is on its way so as you all know and I'm sorry some of this might be um, 
no news to you, but it, it, it's a, just a generic presentation that basically covers um, the process of the census. So it's happening in March 2021, on the 21st of March to be precise. Um, and the hope is that we can get everyone to take part. Um, the more people we get to do it, uh, the more accurate the data is that comes out of the census at the end. And it helps, as it says there, on services and funding decisions by uh, local and national governments. So billions of pounds are allocated to local services um, using census-based information every single year. Um, and again, as, as I said, the more people that complete it, the more accurate that data is, the more accurate the funding decisions will be um, as and when they're made. So one of the really important things, keeping personal information safe. Um, this is predominantly going to be a digital um, census completion this time around. Um, and there's probably concern out there that maybe there's uh, an opportunity for this information not to be safe, but it is. Um, and even though you put personal data into the census questionnaire, that data is anonymized for a hundred years. It's just the statistics that come out of the census that are utilized to make the decisions. Um, and then, as it says in the last point, it is a legal obligation. Uh, it has been since 1920 to complete the census. So no one knows your communities better than you. Pretty straightforward, really. It's a case of, um, you know, you know within your own wards, within your, your own parish councils, um, your own communities better than anybody. Um, and it's helpful to encourage as many people within your communities to complete the census. So again, you know, there's an accurate uh, data output from the census when, when that information comes out in 2022. Um, so I'm asking for whatever help you can give to raise awareness and understanding of the census in your community. Knowledge, awareness and access. So your unique understanding of, of your community's interests and the challenge they face can help us plan and implement and support that lets everyone join in. Um, your community links can help us spread the word about what the census is and why it matters. And this will help build trust in the process and boost participation. And your, net, your networks can help us reach those members of your community who need support too. So we need to make sure that everyone is included and counted. There'll be loads of support out there um, from the census team. Um, there's area managers, there's um, a, a whole host of field support team that will be uh, able to go door to door. Um, obviously, we're dependent on everything with the COVID restrictions, but the hope is that they'll be able to go to the door in the same way that a, you know, an Amazon driver or a DPD driver can and, and just ask questions from a, a socially distanced um, from a social distance to support anybody that might need that assistance with uh, the census. There's also going to be uh, two um, census support centres specifically set up um, to enable people that, that may want to complete it online to go to them. Um, there's going to be one in Hive uh, one in Hyde and one in Folkestone um, where people can actually go and there'll be um, some specific staff that are set up there that are trained to help people complete the census. Again, you know, this is all COVID dependent on what we can do and how we can do it and, and what that all looks like. So as I said, it takes part, uh, takes place on the 21st of March, 2021. It's gonna be a digital first census, but importantly, paper will be available for those that need it. So those that don't have access digitally or are not confident to do it digitally, can get a paper questionnaire and, and, and already those that um, there is a targeted audience of people that will get a paper questionnaire first time around because of um, the, the particularly rural areas where the, there's very poor broadband and Wi-Fi. Um, we're focusing on engaging with everyone, including up underrepresented and hard to reach groups uh, and help will be available for people who need support to take part online. Um, and that's an important part of my role is the engaging with everyone It's is to try and reach out to the groups that you know may have trust issues with completing the census, may have language barrier issues, uh, may have learning disabilities. It, it's reaching out to charities and organisations that, that can help support me in getting the word out there to, to help people see the benefits of the census and not fear it. So these are the timelines. Um, the second one along the online help centre, as I mentioned earlier, goes live in, in early February. Uh, and then the mass marketing campaign on TV, radio, newspaper, 
begins on the 12th of February, telling people that the census is coming. Uh, and the important bits for the household. So between the 22nd and the 3rd of March, every household receives a postcard telling them that the census is coming. No more information than that, just to let them know it's on its way and the date of it. Uh, and then the electronic online digital support service goes live on the 23rd of February. Uh, and the contact centre and support centres go live on the 1st of March. And then this is the important one. On the, between the 3rd and the 13th, every household will receive a pack telling them to join in and how to do it. It will have their own unique code within that pack for them to complete the census, ideally online. But within that pack, there'll be all of the help that's available from telephone numbers to call, the call centres to um, how to order a paper questionnaire if you prefer to complete it that way which leads us into the census down the 21st of March, but it doesn't just stop there. Um, not everybody's going to do it on the 21st of March. So we then have a team of people that then, then go to support people that may not be able to do it. And we haven't been able to, to pick them up or people that have just chosen not to do it. Um, and then the last day to complete the questionnaire is on the 4th of May, 2021. Um, and that is it in a nutshell. Um, It's um, still planning to go ahead as it all originally was. We're obviously having to adapt all the time with the COVID restrictions. Um, it's not made the job easy by any stretch of the imagination, as you can imagine, but it's the same for everybody else. And you know, a lot of those charities and community groups that, that we would have been hoping to get a lot of assistance from are obviously tied up with a whole host of, of other issues, quite understandably. So uh, the more support we can get from... Um, people within their own communities to help you know raise the awareness initially but then to, to maybe support or, or help us support with those vulnerable individuals will be really helpful um that's me um anybody have any questions thank you lee anybody come in oh i'm not doing very well here well, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not doing very well here at the moment. You wouldn't think that I've been on, on meetings all day long, would you, since 9.30 <laughs> this morning? But that's, that's probably the problem. I was just going to say, in terms of uh, one of the things that came up today in one of my hub meetings was um, uh, from the hubs, uh, and particularly from the Romney Marsh hub, is yeah. to was asking about that about the, the census and you know what how how they can actually support so so there are a lot of um organizations out there who i think will be able to support it's just a case of making sure that they are aware of what they what they can do and how they can support um and so i mean we've got the three hubs in the, in the district that I'm sure would be uh, very useful in getting that information out, as well as all our voluntary organisations, who I know are not visiting at the moment, but they are making a lot of phone calls. Yeah, I, I've, I've had contact with both John at the Romney Day Care, to, uh, Care Centre and with Nick at Three Hills Sports Club, if that's what it's called, I think it is, isn't it? Um, and I actually spoke to John yesterday, and he's very keen to support me. He mentioned the meeting today, and he's going to pick up a call with me um, tomorrow with regards to how we can work together going forward but absolutely yeah I think um, I think all those three hubs in Folkestone, Hyde and New Romney are all going to be keen to support so yeah that's a it's a very valid point. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? See no hands or waving fingers or flashing. Good evening <laughs> Graham obviously you're not on screen but I presume you can hear us may not be able to speak to us either. Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Lee. Okay. We'll let you go home in this lovely, sunny, hot day that we've been having. <laughs> go put the factor 50 on. <laughs> Find your way through the flood. <laughs> That's great. Thank you very much for the opportunity to, to present tonight. And... Um, I will send a pack through to Kate that, that can be forwarded on to anyone that's on the meeting or anyone that isn't that would that would want it. That's got lots of um, different information about the census that may may or may not be of use. But um, it'll have my email address on this. If anyone thinks of any questions afterwards, then feel free to, to contact me. Thank you, Lee. Thanks very much. Have a good evening. Thank you.
Item six is the COVID vaccination programme. Andy Blaskovich and Alistair Clifford are down for this. Chairman, I think... He's only just coming in, is he? A Andy's having trouble connecting to Zoom this evening for some reason. Um, yeah, he's he's just messaged me, um, Andy. Oh. I think he's, yeah, he's definitely having some problems. Oh, he's in that now. It's perfect timing. <laughs> I'll see him. I need to, I'll, I'll share my screen anyway, because I've got the slides. Right. While, whilst Andy gets his, his connected. Okay. Um. Andy's still having trouble connecting. He's, he's with us, but there's no sound. He doesn't appear okay. to have no sound. I can I can pick up the slides if need be, so we can we can carry on, and then if he if he joins in, he can he can go for it. So, um, a, a small presentation here just on the um, you the EU's exit from uh, Europe, and then we'll go into the COVID nineteen response across the um, district. So I think uh, Andy's presented to you all in the past. I think about the Operation Fennel. Uh, program. So I won't spend too long on this, but obviously Operation Fennel is the traffic management within Kent of HGVs, um, consisting of Brock Manston, TAP 256, TAP 20, and Brock M20, um, and obviously important places like the Sevington um, Lorry Facility at Ashford that's opened up. Uh, it doesn't necessarily count for tourist traffic, but obviously since we um, the French put the, closed the borders on the, on about the 20th of De December. Um, the plan has been um, quickly quickly altered to cover those. So um, on the 20th, because of the, the closure of the ports, um, the KRF, um, in conjunction with the police, Highways England and ourselves, declared it a major emergency. Um, at the moment, Operation Brock M20 is active with the contraflow between eights and nine. And this is um, open for local and tourist traffic and TAP 256 is currently not active. The congestion in Kent is considered to be minimal. Um, we're seeing very low volumes of freight at the moment, but we do expect that to start picking up now. Um, and we have the measures in place to manage quite a lot more traffic than we, are, we have at the moment. Obviously things have calmed down a lot since the pre-Christmas and Christmas period when there was just a lot of lorries everywhere. Um, the other sites that are active are, are Sevington, Waterbrook, Manston, Epsley and Stock 24. And there are a range of um, Department for Transport, um, information sites, testing sites, and um, places for hauliers to park up overnight while they await information. Um, one of the key things that's happened, obviously, is the COVID-19 testing requirements for all drivers to enter France. Um, that was put on pretty quickly at Manston, um, as places like Lydon have been opened up and then reclosed whilst we remain low. Um, the push really is for hauliers to get tested before they come into Kent. Um, there is a consultation running at the moment that closes tonight that does actually... Um, review whether it should be a legal requirement for any lorries within Kent traveling to the border to have evidence of a negative COVID test. If that is approved by ministers, that will probably be likely um, put in by next week. Um, for, just for your information, in the last 24 hours uh, alone, 4,329 hauliers have been tested with three positive. They're seeing about 0.1 of the percent uh, positivity rate which is, is just pretty low, um, but there's no signs of the French uh, backing off on this. And in fact, today, Holland have um, started to suggest that they are going to bring in testing as well. Um, HGV compliance, obviously, is a big thing uh, in some of the parishes and, and stuff like that. So KCC are the lead authority and have been given special powers to undertake clamping of lorries who are legally parked on the website there is um 
uh, a facility for residents or anyone to um, report illegally parked vehicles. And as a district, we are working with Kent to highlight any hot hotspot areas and to keep an eye on the numbers in and around our, our key locations. So any questions on that before I move on to our, our um, COVID response? Thank you, Andy. Uh, not Andy, it's Alistair, isn't it? Yeah, sorry. Um, no problem. One, quest, one question I've got was that you're still using Manston as well as the M20 for your testing. Is it likely to continue ad, ad, ad infinitum, as you might say, um, that you're going to use both sites, or will, you be, will they be looking to just do things on the M20 on the junctions 8 to 9? So the, the, the hope is that um, we would remove those facilities. Now, you can only really test on the, on the road whilst the um, road is shut because it's too dangerous. Yeah. So at the moment, they're, they're um, telling drivers to go to Sevington, Ashford or to Manston. Now, obviously, the plan is that lorries uh, and HGVs should come to Kent ready to, to cross and it not be the responsibility of the Department for Transport to test lorry drivers at their own expense. So commercial operations are operating up. I think there's 31 DFT sites outside of Kent now ready to go so that the, the requirements inside Kent are, are reduced massively. I think the, the plan at the moment is obviously Manston is a really safe option to have ready to go. Um, and there's no plans to pull it as such in the, in the short term. Okay. Uh, Jenny and then Paul. And then sorry. Yeah. Can I ask Jenny first? <laughs> thank thank you, Frank. Um just to thank you, Alistair. And you know, um, I mean the the idea of well, being able to clamp lorries, you know how we welcome that in, in our area. And Frank, I'm sure you're you could um um you're, you're, you'd be ha you're happy about that as well in terms of hotspots at Sillinge and at Junction 11. Yeah. Um, but one of the things I didn't know, and I've just looked and, and thanks for that, is that KCC now have a, 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 a website. Well, they have a link to actually report. I didn't know that. And that's something that is really, really very useful, especially when you've got people emailing you all the time with lorries parked here and lorries parked there, to be able to suggest that they report them now to KCC is going to be really, really helpful. Yes, agreed. And, and it, it must be made clear as well that they need to have parked illegally to be clamped. Yes. Um, not just it's annoying that they've parked there. Um, no. But yeah, the, tool, the tool's available to anyone. Um, and as, as um, councillors yourselves, if you're having or you notice hot problem areas, if you let me or Fred Miller know, we can take that into our meetings. Uh, you know, with a direct route in, but obviously that, that's just for, for you rather than individuals to report. Yes, yeah. No, but being able to report online, I think, is is really good. Um, and, and assuming there's action taken, which is really the, the, the crux of the matter. Yes, certainly. I mean, they, they've resourced quite thoroughly. They're very heavily resourced in the evenings and uh, early hours of the mornings when lorry will park up overnight. And much lighter, obviously, in the morning when they were moving around. Thank you. It was on the news tonight. They showed lorries of Hotfield being with clamps on them. Paul. Okay, thank you, Frank. Yeah, I'd just like to ask a question. Um, uh, we've received a couple of um, uh, e emails about it, and there's been a, quite a bit on uh, social media as well, um, about the littering and, and the waste management where lorries are parked up either overnight or for an extended period of time. So I'd just like to know really what's being done in terms of managing those areas where we have had lorries parked for an extended period of time or where they're being held overnight um, that's having an impact on, um, on, on waste and, and, and littering. I don't know if you could talk to about that at all, Alistair. Yeah, certainly. Uh, the majority of the problems that we've seen on social media were um, I wouldn't say fortunately, but we're really focused around Dover where they'd stopped the lorries and they were all parked up there. So Dover has been working really heavily with Highways England to clear those with Veolia. 
Um, I know that's taking a lot of resource and it's an, a, quite an astonishing amount of waste. Our areas um, haven't been reported as, as bad, um, as far as I'm aware, but I, I don't run the waste contract. So if, I, if you wanted more information, I could get that from Andrew Rush and his contacts in Veolia. I think that'd be very handy if you wouldn't mind, please, Alistair. Thanks for the uh, uh, for the response. Appreciate that. No problems. Terry, Terry, you wanted to speak. Are you still muted? Uh, me? Uh, hang on. No, you're muted now. Yeah, there yeah. you are. Uh, can I speak now then? Yeah. Um, it's not really a question. It's an annoyance, if you like. Um, annoying because we are doing, the UK and Kent, of course, are doing a lot of work. And, you know, we all know what work they're doing, um, trying to control traffic, um, COVID testing, etc. And what's happening, of course, is you will have read that uh, Scottish wagons full of fish have now their their cargoes have gone rotten because of mainly because of French action. Now Barnio today, Barnio Michel Barnio today had the cheek to say all this, of course, is happening because of Brexit. He is absolutely adamant that we will be blamed. He didn't win, so we're going to be blamed. What I want to know is we're doing all this. Is France doing the same over there? I don't believe they are. And if they're not, or even if they are, can we please put massive um, tariffs on their wine, cheese, cars, washing machines, and so on? In other words, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. I do not understand why we have restrictions that the French and the rest of the EU can just come in as though nothing's happened. I'm annoyed. A lot of people are annoyed. It's got to be sorted. Not a question perhaps for this committee, but perhaps somebody can um, give some indication as to what the hell is happening and why are we all being taken as mugs? Finish. Thank you. <laughs> Neil? I just yes. don't so, understand. Thank you, Frank. Right. Right. Yes, going on the other way, um, when uh, when this happened and all the lorries were queuing up and uh, they were there for two or three days or so, um, it was quite surprising that um, people from the middle of England had to come down and feed them. Um, there doesn't seem to be any system in place where um, there's some sort of care for these people who are parked up there at no fault of their own. Um, you, you know, the welfare of it is one or two toilets about, I grant you, but food and things like that was brought in by outside volunteers, really. How are you going to address that in the future? A, a supplement. Our, our French drivers in France and the rest of the EU, do they have to have a negative test before they dare to drive over here? in the same way that we, our drivers have to be tested and, and foreign drivers here have to be tested before they can go that way. I want to know whether these other people have to be tested before they come this way. It really is the most unfair. Um, and, you know, I know the unfairness of it all. And it can't be swept under the carpet. We're being browbeaten by Barnier and the rest of the EU. Alistair? Okay, I can, nothing I, to do with what I was saying. I can respond on the uh, welfare of, from what I know. Obviously, the welfare um, responsibilities really fall to KCC and uh, the Department for Transport. Uh, we, we are there to support a few mutual aid. I know, obviously, lots of stuff was put in place for the EU exit, obviously, for the 1st of January. Lorry drivers are uh, expected to be self-sufficient for 48 hours on our roads. That is one of the requirements of being an operator in the UK, as far as, as, far as I'm aware. Um, so obviously when they closed the border with no notice, that was a, a, you know, a big shock. And the numbers before Christmas were astonishingly high. 
because um, you know it, it appeared that they were all trying to move goods out of the UK before we left the EU um, because of the, 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 the changes. So a lot went in, um, including a MACA request, which is for the armed forces to support. Now that does all take time. And I think that's why the 48 hours, you know, and things like that are in place. I think a lot has been learned from their from their teams about how to do it. Obviously, delivering food to 5,000 people and toilets and getting them all places is hard. I think there was some unfair press reporting at times as well. I, I saw what was going on in the meetings and the hard work the police, Highways England, the departments of transport were doing on that. But yeah, there, there probably could have been, there's definitely lessons learned and, and that is definitely being fed back into the future plans and future, you know, future issues. I'm sure the border will be shut again in the future. At some point, it, it's been shut in the past briefly. So that, yeah, let things learn. And I think they're working on it. Okay, thank you. If I, if I can, Chairman, can, can an answer be given some time by staff as to what is happening in France whether they are restricted in the same way that we are, whether they can throw their stuff over here tariff-free while we can't. I want to know the answers to those questions. Not now, but I'd like to know the answers from the staff. <laughs> yeah, um, if I may, as Andy's not able to connect, um, I think, I mean, there, there are a number of questions there, Councillor, but unfortunately they're not really within our remit as a district council. So um, I'm sure that we could get you uh, some suggestions of which department to contact to ask those questions, but I'm afraid there wouldn't be an officer within the council that it'd be appropriate for us to be able to answer those questions, I'm afraid. Thank you, Charlotte, for that. Are there any other comments or questions for Alistair on the Brexit bits? No. Okay, no, Joe, should I move on to the, the COVID section? Yeah, no, I say neither of those who are not in view want to say anything. No, yes, carry on then, Alistair, please. Okay, so I've taken the data from today. So the uh, regional data is showing that the, the whole southeast area is still the third highest region for COVID cases, um, primarily Dartford, Graves, uh, Gravesham, um, continue to be very high and the NHS and the South East Coast Ambulance Service are under huge pressure. There has been a temporary place of rest um, stood up in Aylesford that is taking a lot of the mortuary, um, helping a lot of the mortuaries out because space is um, very tight. Um, rather positively, the lockdown seems to be working in Folkestone Hive as it is in a lot of the country actually, the numbers seem to be plateauing. So that's, that's a really pleasing sight. Now, Kent have rolled out 14 um, asymptomatic testing sites across the district. Um, and I've put a link in here for where they are. The two locations within Folkestone and Hive are Folkestone Library and the Hawkins Community Centre. And then Kent-wide mass COVID-19 vaccination centres are up and running in Aylsham. There's one due to be open in Sheerness pretty soon, uh, as well as Ashford, and then sites in Folkestone, Margate and Gravesham should be open by the end of the month. So within Folkestone Hive, um, great news is that uh, Folker is being worked on at the moment for a mass vaccination site. Uh, the capacity there is, is large, obviously they reckon they can do up to 3000 vaccinations per day at that site. We are working uh, with the relevant bodies to make sure that happens, doing everything we can. The other mass vaccination site planned within the district is Lid Airport. Works are ongoing there, but um, I'm not sure on the uh, operational date as of yet, but obviously everything is moving at such speed, it does seem to change hour by hour. I can give we, you an update on that later on. Yeah, f fantastic. Yeah, I would say the, the Lid Airport one is, is because it's not our site, we're a little bit further away from it than, say, Folker, where we're, we're right in the mix. Now, we've got a vaccination site running out of the Civic Centre. Um, since, since the summer, really, we've been hosting the mobile testing unit out of the Civic Centre and doing the flu jabs for the local surgeries. And that's gone really well. So unusually, they've 
they've allowed for, for that site to be a drive-through centre, which has really helped out the local surgeries. Um, the infrastructure started going in for today in the car park. And uh, hopefully, depending on when the vac vaccines actually arrive on site, it will be going live on the 18th of January. Um, there's another vaccination site operational in Oaklands and Hive. Then we have symptomatic testing sites um, at the stadium car park in Aldridge Road. The MTU site that was at the Civic Centre has now been moved um, to Marine Parade Car Park, uh, which is uh, operated by Folkestone Harbour Company. And obviously we have the local testing site at the stadium in Cheriton. And this is how the Civic Centre um, is, is planning on working. So basically the back area, you, people will drive into the Civic Centre. There'll be four bays for um, vaccines. People will drive up, have their information taken through the car, uh, go into the waiting room, be vaccinated, and then they'll wait for 15 minutes until they're given clearance to leave. Um, they're hoping to achieve around about um, 400 a day at this site once they get the vaccines. To, that's to make sure that we get through the delivery of the, uh, the vaccines as they come in. So that was very quick. Um, it's all working uh, at pace at the moment. Everything is developing very quickly. So that's the latest information I have for you. So any questions on that? Paul, Paul do you want to go ahead with your bit first? Yeah, if I may. Um, we've been in close contact with the primary care networks down here um, and um, with the Romney Marsh Community Support Hub as well. Um, and so the intention um, is that the facility at Lead Airport uh, is due to start on Wednesday. Um, and through the Community Support Hub, we've been asked to, to provide volunteers to help uh, with meeting and greeting and generally get people you know, through the facility. Uh, the intention is that it's going to operate from nine in the morning till six in the evening. Um, and we're looking at trying to get 15 volunteers per day to, to support the, uh, I say, the meet and greet and get people through that. Um, that, that particular location at the moment um, is going to be operating with the Pfizer uh, vaccine. So there is a requirement to make, as part of that facility, um, a 15 minute waiting time after, which of course slows the whole process down in terms of, of moving people through. Um, and Romney Marsh Community Support Hub um, we put out a call to all the volunteers today to try and help um, with managing the logistics of that. Um, and the intention is that the um, community support hub transport, which they have, uh, will be used to help get people um, who don't have their own uh, transport arrangements through. And the focus initially will be for the over 80s. Um, so that's what we're looking at doing at the moment. And we've we put a call out to other organisations, Romney Hall and Dimchurch Railway, uh, for example, uh, the Rotary Club and people who can just help and people who that know the area and feel comfortable with helping to manage people through there. Um, there was originally going to be uh, an arrangement for shuttle buses between the airport and the bus stop, um, but that's not going to be provided now. Uh, and, and the reason for that is because the stagecoach service is so appalling um, that you couldn't deal with having, you know, 30 or 40 people turning up at the same time. Uh, it, it, it just wasn't the right thing to do. So hence the, the call for the um, community support hub to provide uh, their transport, which of course they'll use their train drivers and they're used to um, moving people, uh, particularly elderly people around. It's what they do and what they've been doing for nearly 30 years. So that's it. Thank you very much, Alistair. Yeah, thank you. That sounds thank excellent. You know. It's progressing well down there. Terry. Terry. Frank, could I have hey, a word? Yeah. Go on then, Lazo. Terry hasn't come in yet. So. Oh, he hasn't. Okay. Go on. Um, thanks very much indeed, Alistair. I'm sorry I can't, you can't see me. Um, just as well, because I'm just getting over of COVID. Um, I'm, I'm just coming out of the, my um, uh, isolation period. And it's the, been the most terrifying ordeal I've ever, ever had. And I'm 67 now. Um, fortunately, I didn't end up in hospital. Um, in recent days, we've looked at, uh, we've heard on the news about um, 
um, dispensing chemists um, uh, offering offering flu jabs. Is, is that something that is is of interest to Folkestone and Hyde? Uh, it was something I would I would I would have to talk to other people out probably uh, about the the requirements of that. I mean, it's glad to hear you're doing well as well. Still here. Mm -hmm. Uh, and 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 saying saying sort of uh, pharmacies um, that of course includes potentially um, pharmacies in supermarkets and so on. Um, it's where it's actually where people go. Um, yes. Yes. They would sooner, I'm sure, pop into Superdrug or um, go and get vaccinated uh, on my on on the rounds of on the rounds of uh, Tesco's, um, they would feel a lot more, um, less defensive doing that. And I thought it was a fantastic idea, but I'm not quite sure how, you know, how that sort of, how that would go down. I um, think some of the larger ones are being utilised uh, around. I think the difficulty is the specialist equipment to store the vaccine, a lot of it, um, getting people in and out. And then once you... I know from, I only know this from the, the civic centre set up and the reason those surgeries have all joined together is that once you receive a um, vaccine delivery and you dispense it, you only have three and a half days to deliver that. So you've got to get 1500 people through your doors to make it worthwhile. So I think in the community, they're using the, the is it the Pfizer one? I, I can't remember. They're going, taking that into the community as the stable vaccine. And the the other one, obviously, they're, they're yeah, they're using the the faster one, I believe. I may have got them the wrong way around there. So well, the Oxford's e much easier to store. Yeah, I'm not I'm not a PhD expert, but right. that that was my understanding and why the Folkestone surgeries are joined together to 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 work like that. But I really thought that was quite a quite a a good in initiative if it, if they can make it work. Yes. Yeah. Terry, have another go. Thank you for just a bit, just to just to <laughs> reinforce that message. Um, the um, uh, new, one of the new Romney pharmacists has applied um, to be a dispenser of, of the vaccines, Teo, a new Romney pharmacy, and he's the lead pharmacist for the primary care network. So he deals with the other pharmacies in uh, New Romney, uh, Lid, and Dimchurch. Um, and so, you know, that's something else which will be, um, he'll be pushing on with that um, over the next few weeks. So again, I think it's, it's very encouraging that um, with using the Oxford vaccine, which they, which they can do and doesn't have the same uh, storage requirements, um, it does open those particular venues up. And, and, you know, there is, as quite rightly said earlier on, a real demand and a real pull from the community um, to be able to use facilities such as that. So that's breaking news, as it were. Terry, have another go. <coughs> yes, Chairman. Hello? Am I turned yeah. on on YouTube or what? We can hear you. I'm OK, am I? Um, yeah, yeah a couple of little points. The good news is that the um, I did follow the link to local um, uh, asymmetric um, testing facilities and did arrange to go down the Folkestone and library last Friday with my wife. Um, extremely easy. The whole list of two minute slots actually covered a page and there were none of them taken when I booked. I could have booked any time, any day. Um, in fact, I booked, went along, no problem, about three people waiting outside, went in, got the result within half an hour and thankfully we're both negative. Now, um, the point is, look, I did overhear one of the soldiers saying to one other um, customer, if you like, that they had facilities to test 800 people there a day, and the most they've done was under 400. I can understand that because the booths, they're set up with about 10 booths in there, and they're only two in use. They're very, very, very underutilised. That's the first thing, but good job I got my negative report. Um, on, on the vaccinations, 
I would love to be able to get one done in dim church surgery, uh, dim church um, pharmacy. Um, the thought of going down the lid is horrific to me, although I've got my own car. I think what people have got to understand is that the marsh is statistically under government um, statistics, one of the most deprived areas in Britain. A load of people haven't got their own transport. Many of them are elderly. I'm elderly, but many are elderly. Um, for them to go down the lid is impossible. Um, there was talk of the uh, academy being used, which would be much, much better. I would love to go down to Folkestone, um, Folkestone Centre for my jab. That's a, just jump on a bus and you're there. Anybody on the march can jump on a 102, go down and get their jab. It's impossible. The, to, to expect people from the marsh to trot down the lid is just pie in the sky. So that can be written off. It won't be used. You may get a few people. And finally, is it still the case that we don't go to any of these um, vaccination centres until we are invited to go? Yes, that's, it is. Yes, that, that's yeah. correct. Okay, so I'll sit and wait. <laughs> yeah. Um, my wife, I'll just say my wife is... Um, clinically um, vulnerable, very, very seriously clinically vulnerable, and I will be 80 in three months' time. So we're pretty well vulnerable, the two of us. So I'm, you know, I speak for myself, but others on the marsh. Bear in mind what I've said about the marsh. It's a deprived area. Many people, even older than me, dare I say, and many people without transport. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, <clears throat> thank, thank you. Sorry, I don't know how to follow all of that. I was just going to make, I was just going to say about L Laszlo, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to hear that, Laszlo. Have a lot of sympathy with you. My husband's in the same situation. Um, so, um, it, and it's not been easy, but I have to say the, the, the support we've had has been absolutely amazing. Couldn't, couldn't wish for anything better. So it, it's been great. Uh, on, on vaccination, I mean, I've spent an, I spent hours and hours on different meetings with regard to testing and vaccination and everything else, and and I think you have to realise we get these um, mass uh, vaccination sites up and running and working, and when the vaccine becomes a bit more um, available and and can be distributed, I think the surgeries and uh, health centres and other places will will come online. So I completely take your point, uh, Terry, and and I can tell you that Susan Priest and Alistair and his team and 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 Andy B, they've worked tirelessly to to get these sites and it, actually to get something down in, on the marsh. So to get something down on the marsh, I think you know we we we've been pushing for it ever since ever since uh, the. The vaccination sites were the large vaccination sites were mentioned. So I, you know, I don't underestimate the work that's gone into to, to doing this. Um, I would suggest that probably, you know, there is a priority list. You can look on the. It's, I think um, Susan Priest sent it out to all councillors. It can be seen on the um, Kent County Council site, and there is a priority list, and and you can see the order in which you're 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 likely to be called. Yes, you do have to wait for them to. To call, um, and I think that's sensible. I think people, uh, if they're going to take doctors' time and surgery time and and other NHS um, resources up by asking when they're going to to be vaccinated, that's only going to delay the the the, the matter. Um, and, and I thought something else I was going to say then, but I've probably forgotten. But okay, thank you. <laughs> I did thank you, Jenny. What I would say is, I'm going on from Jenny's point about um, waiting for having to wait for a letter or a phone call, whatever it is. If it was open to everybody to go, then a lot of people would go in the non um, vulnerable crap categories, and people who are in, in the same state as you, Terry, and myself, um, and Jenny as well, would maybe get knocked at the bottom of the list simply because they hadn't pushed themselves forward. Whereas if we wait until we join join in the queue in the right order, then yeah. I'm in the uh, same I, I'm in the same category, I, the over 75, so. 
And if I could just say, like the um, the vaccination site for all all uh, North Downs West um, um, surgeries is actually Oakland's in Hive. So they've all got to travel. And for me, which is my surgery is in Selinge, which is actually in Folkestone and Hive, but the surgery comes under Ashford. Um, should, when I'm called, if I'm called, if my husband's called, um, we, we will have to go to Ashford. There you go. Uh, anything else you want to say, Alice, Alistair? No, that's all for me. Thank you. Thank you for coming. I will let, no let, let you get away. Thank you very much. Have a nice evening all. Uh, the next item is the my my account presentation, um, which is going to be done by Steve Weekly or Dean Pratt or both. Thank you, Councillor Hobbs. Yes, Steve, um, I'll, I'll be starting the presentation. I'm sure Dean uh, will pitch in part way through. Um, hopefully, you can all see my screen now. So. As you're aware, the, the My Account's been launched now for a few months, um, and I, I think it's safe to say that it's just going from strength to strength. I've just had a quick look at the figures tonight of how many we've got registered now, and we've got 7,050 uh, residents registered for, for the My Account, which is, is truly amazing in the short time we've, we've been we've been live with it, basically. Um, the, the changes we've made is what I'm going to show go through with you this evening. From, from when you saw it last time. I think most of you are familiar with the basic uh, My Account we had now. Um, one area we have changed recently is the council tax and benefits area. And then this was following customer feedback. Um, they were saying that, that they were struggling where to find the forms and the inter information. So we've actually changed the label of that button sort of recently and changed the wording there as well. And the feedback now is that uh, they can actually find the information far better. So all the time we're listening to Karen, Karen Everett's team, working with her and her team to make improvements as we go forward. The other area I think we've changed since I showed you last was the elections information. Uh, this is the new area on the page. Previous to this, there was just like a general help video, but we did some, some volumetrics around the amount of time it was used, and it was so underutilised, we thought we'd utilise that space more for the elections information. So I've been working with Paul in elections to go through what information he wants on there. But at the moment, it's just static. So it's just the upcoming elections that are on there at the moment. What we do intend to do going forward is that if there's by-elections or parish elections in your ward, uh, this will be pertinent to you. So you don't have information that actually reflects <clears throat> your own ward or, or parish, etc. So again, it's given that personal experience to the customer. The My Planning was on there last time I showed you, I believe, and that just returns all the planning applications within 500 metres of your, your property. The big, big area we've been working on over the last, last couple of months is the services area. So this is really so to make it far more transactional for the customer. And this is for them to be able to apply uh, from within their My Account. I don't know why it's not loading properly. Bear with me one second. Sorry about that. I've been inactive for a while, so it logged me out. So this, this is the uh, the services area. So so the way this works, the way we've done it is we've got we're trying to sort of um, keep it in line with the website. Uh, so we're keeping a constant theme going. So we've got the report to apply for it and pay for it. So what these buttons here do, they take you directly through to the report, it apply for it, pay for it, links within the website. So from within the website or from within the My Account, you're, you're still getting that same experience. What we have found, though, is, and again, this is listening to customer feedback, is that sometimes it's not always, always obvious on the website where to find information. And that's another project we're working on separately at the moment. So, so what we've done is we've broken down into the, into the key service areas. So from a customer's point of view, I go into my account and I say, OK, I've got a waste issue. So I click on the waste button. And then we've got four columns customers can choose from. So we've got all the reported information. So it might be a collection data village. It might be the animal. Uh, it might be fly tipping. Um, and then we've got request it. So I might want an additional bin. I might want a replacement bin or a special collection or waste information. So what we've tried to do is, is group these that make sense to our customers. And again, we're getting feedback on this and making changes. So, so it's very dynamic. It's not static. We're making changes all the time. <clears throat> so just to give you another service area, for example, if I was to use council tax as another example, we've got your council tax. That's inf information about your council tax. Then there's a whole section on payments and discounts. 
And then if you've got any changes to your council tax, or if you're in arrears, if you received a final notice or received a summons, there's information there. So the way these links work, if I, if I continue with the waste one, <clears throat> so as a customer, I come into here, okay, my, my, my bin's been missed. So I click on Miss Bean Collection. And what this would do is, and this is intentional, um, we, we had a lot of talk about should it go directly to a form or should it go directly to the website? And, and the, the decision has been made that it goes directly to the website. And the thinking behind that is that um, that way we can contain all the information on the website so a customer can read the information that's pertinent to the report they're trying to make before actually going ahead and making the report because it may be their bin wasn't out within 24 hours or it wasn't out before 7 o'clock in the morning, etc. So that they may not need to report it. Once they've read the information, they can, they can then go through and actually go ahead and report the missed bin. And because they've already logged into their My account, it's, it's remembered who they are automatically. So it, it knows my name, it knows my email address, uh, and it knows my address. So that is automatically filled in for the customer. And when you go onto your next page and you go through, and it's a very, very simple process to go through. I won't actually submit this because this is in the live system. <clears throat> you just say which bins have been missed, go onto your next page. So I've missed a field out there and go through and fill the form, et cetera. Um, and that's very, very similar to all the service areas. So waste has been live for a while now, and that's been really successful with a take up from the customers. Um, I'll keep regular statistics on that. And we're, we're around about the 50% mark now of all transactions for waste are being done online, uh, which, which I think is, re is really, really positive. There was early targets sort of 20 to 30%. So we've actually gone past that um, by a great rate of knots, actually. And, and again, we're working constantly all the time with Karen's team in customer services and how to make improvements. Um, it's not a question. I think the old adage of um, supply and what we think the customer wants as opposed to what they really want is becoming really paramount in service delivery now, which is why we get that information back from Karen's team and the, and the feedback from customers. <clears throat> so going through these again, licensing. Again, you can apply for license. Licensing, I think, is going to be a huge, huge change from next week. The next area we're doing at the moment is uh, what we call reg services. So that covers areas like private sector housing, uh, environment enforcement, uh, environmental protection, uh, food and hygiene, and, and licensing. So we're at the moment launching that as a back office system. But the benefit that brings us as, as an authority is that we can actually have a lot more forms online that are interactive for the customer. Historically on the licensing, we've had an awful lot of forms online, um, but they've been generally sort of static PDFs that a customer has to download, fill in, post into us, send a check into us, that's been matched up by the back office. With the new licensing forms that we're starting to launch next week um, and get ready to go live over this weekend, it's a whole new experience for the customer. So what the customer can then do, as opposed to downloading the form, as I just previously said, they go on, they actually complete the application form online, they upload all the evidence at the same time, be it sort of a, a scanned image or a photograph of the information we need. Um, that gets attached to the application form. They submit the application form and at the same time, they're prompted to make a payment. So the payment then comes through at the same time. So it's, it's, I think it's a win-win situation with the licensing area from next week, because what that means from a, from a customer's point of view is the journey is, is so much simpler in as much it's all contained within the one transaction. And from a back office point of view as well, I think it brings other benefits as you're not trying to uh, tie payments up in with application forms, et cetera. So um, that in, in, re in return actually gives further benefits to the customer again, because it means we can process this information far quicker because it's all real time. So as soon as that customer has clicked submit on the application form, in real time, it's received into the back office into queue to be work on. So um, <clears throat> I think from next week, you should see even more improvements with, with the My Account. Another area we've worked on really with the My Account, and again, this is working with customer services. Um, we, we were, we've had a, quite a few meetings with them and, and realized there's a, a lot of customers out there that would like to have a My Account, but struggle with it a little bit because they're not so okay with IT as other people. So we've devised a mechanism now where uh, customer services can actually set up a My Account for our customers. Um, it's only been launched within the last couple of weeks, but just to give you an idea, last week, customer services set up 171 My Accounts for our customers. 
So the way the process works is the, the customer comes online with their query and, and it's, it's not a hard sale. We're not, we're not pushing down people's throats, but we're saying there's an easier or quicker way of doing this and we're, we're selling it to the customers. Would you like us to help you set up a My Accounts? Um, so on that, if you get a yes, and what they do, they take them through, they create the My Account, my account for the customer. But for security reasons, obviously, we can't set up passwords, et cetera. So <clears throat> what happens is the customer would supply us with their email details. And once the My Account has been set up, um, an email is sent to that customer to say, verify your password. They then create their password and they're up and running with my account. And the, the feedback again we're getting on that is, is really it is really positive again. Um, I, I just really think it's going from strength to strength at the moment. <clears throat> Another area we are doing at the moment as well, and it is, it's the marketing of the my accounts. I think it's fair to say that sort of historically we've done quite a soft launch for it. So I think the take up is excellent because it's been a soft launch. But we're, we're working now heavily with the internal comms team with Katie. And um, we've actually got a, a huge campaign due to go out very, very soon on social media. And they've done some nice graphics for us, uh, which will be coming online on Twitter and on, on, on Facebook, etc. And the, the other area we're looking at promoting the My Account is with the annual billing coming up sort of in March. That's a huge opportunity for us for authority to actually promote My Accounts. Um, so what we're doing at the moment, again, working with comms is to design a leaflet that goes out with the annual billing. So the, the positive result of that is that every single residency in the Folkestone and Hythe district will actually receive information about the My Account as well, because some of the information we're finding back from customers, they weren't even aware of it. So I'm, I'm hoping to see sort of post, post March and April um, the take up is even greater than what we've currently got at the moment. So I think just to, just to summarize, I think the My Account has been a great success. It's been received really well from the customers um, and it's ever changing. We're responding to customer feedback um, and we're looking to develop stuff ourselves all the time as well and to make for further improvements going forward. Dean, did you want to add anything to that at all? No, you've covered everything that's on my list. Um, <laughs> I'm done really well, so no, nothing else to add. <laughs> okay. Any, any questions at all, councillors? Anybody? Um, Steve, uh, it's, yes, it's, hi, Laz, hi. it's Laz Dudas. Thank you very much indeed. It's, um, it's fantastic. I mean, IT is something that um, I'm very interested in. And I'm particularly struck how um, customer intuitive it is. Um, I don't think you really need to know much about IT. You've got it all set out there very, very nicely and neatly and logically. Mm -hmm. um, am I picking up that the... The, the buttons and and the, the way around the screen is, is essentially a, um, a front end to all the other other uh, sites websites sites behind it yeah, which, which, yeah. Makes, makes, which makes complete sense yeah basically it is it's, it's a front end for, for a lot of the areas so end, yeah yeah it's a front end for, for, for the website basically it's a direct link through to the website yeah, so very, very logical yeah thank you fantastic. Yeah, well done. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lassa. <clears throat> Anybody else? Silence rain, no blue hands, no waving <laughs> hands. <laughs> That's either good or bad, Councillor Hobbs. <laughs> yeah, yes, I know. <laughs> it could be taken either way, couldn't it? Okay, thank you, Steve. Okay, thank you very much. And Dean, well, you, you both go home and... We'll go on to the last item. Thank you very much. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you. The budget strategy. Thanks for being so patient, Charlotte and Cheryl. Um, I don't know who's taking the lead. But uh, yeah, I'll take, um, I'll take the lead. Thank you, Councillor okay. Um So uh, the report that you had in your agenda pack um, summarises the overall budget strategy uh, for the 2021-22 budget. Uh, and it outlines the proposals that are being consulted upon. Um, so the medium term financial strategy was agreed by cabinet in November, and that forecasts a deficit of 3.5 million um, for the next financial year. Since then, um, work has been undertaken to identify growth and savings um, and a review of fees and charges, which reduce the forecast budget deficit to 2.6 million. Uh, and appendix one details the growth and savings approved as part of the budget strategy. Um, the budget proposals have been prepared, assuming a 2% council tax increase for next year. 
Um, since this paper was published, the provisional local government finance settlement was announced on the 17th of December, um, from which the council has been allocated additional funding. Um, so there was new homes bonus funding, um, £6,000, um, a lower tier services grant of 159000 and just under 700000 for um, tranche five of the COVID emergency funding. Um, there's also been some further work undertaken to address that deficit. And so the revised deficit that is being presented to Cabinet next Wednesday um, as part of the draft revenue budget is now 1.6 million. Um, there will continue to be further work um, to address the budget deficit, including ongoing reviews of the growth and savings proposals, uh, collection fund assumptions around council tax and business rates income, and use of reserves to arrive at a balanced budget that will be presented to Cabinet and Council for approval on the 24th of February. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions that you may have or comments on the budget proposals. Anybody jumping in? Paul. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, uh, Frank. Yeah, th thank you for that. That was, that was very clear. Um, could I ask what um, what sort of call down have you had on the um, business support grants and other things that um, people have been able to access through uh, through throughout the whole crisis? And has that impacted um, what is being proposed for 2122? Um, can I just clarify, you mean the business rates grants that are announced? That, that's correct, yes, yeah, sorry, I'm, yeah, that's no, correct. That's fine. Um, so, yeah, they are in the process. There have been various different grants um, announced since the start of the pandemic. Uh, I'm not sure where we are, we're probably on about round seven of the type of grants that are being issued, but they are being um, administered and paid out to businesses as they come forward with applications. Um, they don't have an impact on the budget for next year because they're funded directly from the government. So they've part, we're just passporting them from the government to the businesses. Okay, Paul. Thank you for that. Jenny. <laughs> yes, <coughs> thank you, Frank. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm running out of um, voice today. Um, I, I was just going to say, uh, on the payment of the business grants, as a district council, and uh, you know, ha I, I have the opportunity to say how well we have done. We have done better than any other council, I think, in the speed in which we've we've actually paid these grants. So I, I think a really big congratulations to the team. It's not often that we're able to to do that in public, but I think it's really important to say, and just generally to the staff, all staff, but particularly to the finance um, team. You know, it, it hasn't been an easy time. It isn't an easy time. Awful lot of work being done. And, uh, you know, I think we need to appreciate that. Thank you very much. Certainly the, uh, the first lot was done very, very quickly and we've had contact since. Um, on the second lot that came through, um, well, about the third, oh, as you say, we don't know how many lots we're in now, but Certainly, I know the first lot was done very quickly and very efficiently. I think we, we, I think we were in, I don't know, Charlotte will probably tell us, but we were in something like 98% of grants have been paid out within a very, very short space of time, much better than any other district. If I may, I mean, I can touch on a few more detailed numbers if, if the committee are interested. Um, Councillor Hollingsby will know I did update um, some cabinet members recently. Um, so I don't have any data on the very first tranche to hand, but um, they, they were administered um, very quickly. The second um, tranche that we paid was the LRSG closed um, business grants. Um, now that scheme runs until the 31st of January and people can continue to apply um, if, you know, if they're eligible. Um, until the 31st of January. So in that scheme, we've paid 779 businesses, um, about 1.15 million. Um, that's about, we believe that's about 85% of those eligible. Um, however, we have um, attempted at least two chases for all of those businesses that are outstanding. So um, that, that's that 
first uh, first tranche of the closed businesses. And then you'll recall we moved into tier three, um, our, our area, we moved into tier three and we were able to um, automate those um, in terms of the applications as much as possible. So those grants covered the 2nd to the 15th of December, and then there was a small secondary payment for the 16th to the 19th of December. And we had 359 businesses eligible, and we paid uh, about £350,000 out for that tier. Um, we then moved into tier four, um, and we, I believe, were the only Kent authority who were able to make some tier four payments before Christmas. So everybody who had been in tier three um uh, in terms of a closed business um we made those payments just before christmas and everybody who hadn't been in tier three but did qualify for a tier four grant um we made those on the first day back after christmas so um that was much earlier i believe than most of our um uh, counterparts so we paid 779 businesses in that tranche 575,000. Um, and in addition, um, we've been administering the wet lead pubs scheme. So um, up till last week, we've paid 50 of those. Um, and um, we think there's probably about the same pending. That number will have gone up since, but that, that was the last num number I had. And we're just gearing up to um, administer the new scheme um, for um, the current lockdown. Um, and um, we believe we'll be able to administer that in a similar way to we have done the last ones where we're able to get the money out very quickly. Um, I would just reiterate, we are doing this with speed, but also with care. Um, we are undertaking solvency checks um, and um, bank checks. Um, so, um, but, you know, all credit to the team involved. They have worked exceptionally hard um, all year and, uh, it is just worth saying the numbers that I quote there are just the secondary grants. There was a very large scale um, reliefs and grants paid um, during the first lockdown by the team as well. Thank you. Thank you, Charlotte. Yes, Paul. If I may, I just wanted to echo uh, what Jenny has already said, really, and the feedback that we've had locally is, is how efficient that's been and how what, it, what it's done to actually help businesses to continue. Um, and I think it's actually fantastic. And I don't think the district council does itself uh, any favour sometimes in terms of not promoting that. And, and certainly the local view is that it's been absolutely fantastic. And thank you very much. And I don't think there's any doubt that that's helped to keep a number of businesses moving and make decisions about their future that they wouldn't have been able to do otherwise. So thank you very much for everything you've done. We'd really appreciate it. Thank you, Paul. Pass that on to the team. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anybody else? That's it then. Thank you, Cheryl and Charlotte, for your input. I'm sorry you had to come you. last, but I, I gather you drew the straw, short straw, so. <laughs> so I'm told. That was the last item on the agenda, I believe. Just check the right page. So thank you for your attendance. Kate. Yes, Chairman. Um, could I have a quick word with Jennifer before, after everybody's gone? Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, sure. Yeah. I, what I can do is make you host and then, uh, and then you can carry on. Um, Holly, if we can stop the recording now. Yeah, hey, thanks, Frank. Thank you, everybody. See you I again. Don't want that bit recorded. Yeah. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Two to go, one to go, two to go. All right, Brad.